Hello, everyone. I'm Laura Greiner, your host for today's Swine It podcast. And with me today, I have Dr. Brett Ramirez, who is an assistant professor at Iowa State University. Hello, Brett. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you. So, Brett, before we jump into the topic at hand, um, let's have you introduce yourself to the audience a little bit, just so they're familiar with your background. Sure. Yeah, as you already mentioned, I'm an assistant professor in agricultural and biosystems engineering here at Iowa State University. Um, I've been here for just over four and a half years. Um, I have a research and extension appointment. Um, both those areas kind of surround swine and poultry housing, ventilation, energy efficiency, bioenergetics, instrumentation, environmental control, uh, thermal comfort, air quality, gas emissions, kind of you name it. And then more on the extension side um, is related to doing uh, hands-on um, ventilation workshops with producers throughout the state and the country. Um, and I'd probably good enough for, to start. <laughs> no, that sounds great. I think that's a really good introduction to your, for yourself to the audience. Um, I know you, of course, is my ventilation expert, my go-to person. And I know you've also been involved recently in a lot of different projects, right? Anywhere from turkey and poultry barns to going out and looking at already built facilities for a swine and trying to help problem shoot. And so I thought today might be a good opportunity for us to start from the ground up, if you will, and talk about things we should consider when we are planning a facility. And we'll talk sows and then I'll have you talk wean to finish because I know ventilation's different. But let's start there maybe first. What are some things you think producers should be thinking about before they jump in and start building a building today? How long is the podcast? <laughs> 30 minutes. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I'll keep it short then. Um, so I, I think some of the most important important thing. I mean, I'll keep this pretty narrow on the ventilation side, but there's just so many different things that go into that. But if we're narrowly looking at it on the, the for ventilation environmental control, I think probably the, the most important is getting everybody together. So the right people at the right time to discuss these things. Um, just in a lot of some of these past experiences, everybody gets brought in, you know, two months after each other. And then by the end of it, it's just not quite a fully functioning system. And that's everyone from, you know, the engineers, builders, contractors, electricians, plumbers, um, you know, you you just go down the list and they're all, they all get some input, which is really well valued and needed. Um, but it's, it's the timing and synchronization. I think of that input that is just so critical to getting, you know, the, the ventilation portion of it, it done correctly. Um, you know, other things, I think, you know, technology always has to be somewhat considered in that just as it's always changing. And especially in, uh, today with it being changing so rapidly, um, I think producers always have to kind of keep that on the forefront as well as different just changes in style and, and other things that, you know, as you know, the, the way South farms that are ventilated today is quite different than probably four or five years ago. Um, for example, so, you know, being, a, being on top of that and how fast those can change is, um, is always important. Mm -hmm. What would be some, some things for the South farm specifically the, that we should be thinking about today? I know, you know, over the years we've seen ventilation styles change and, and positive ventilation kind of seems to be the one, but there's been some discussion that maybe there's other options that we should be considering and just kind of want to ask you, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, with the the introduction of, you know, filtering incoming fresh air into south farms, you know, it started, you know, traditionally with negative or traditional negative style systems, and we've moved into now positive pressure. So all of our leaks are, you know, clean air is leaking outward. Um, and I think as we we keep moving, I mean, I'd, I'd say with the cost of, you know, between electricity, um, you know, heating and water usage on farms, the you know, I wouldn't be surprised if air conditioning becomes maybe a little bit more uh, looked at. I know there's a few farms out there that are already currently doing it to some extent, um, but things like that and maybe using more heat exchangers and other kind of energy recovery or, or different techniques that kind of cut down on maybe some of the other costs associated with, with ventilation. Mm -hmm. What are some maybe hiccups or things that might trip us up on a south farm that, that we should be watching out for? So, uh, maybe you've been in some barns recently where you've kind of looked at it and go, oh, we should have thought about that before we built or or even after we've built. 
Yeah, I think it it comes down to doing the some of the design math up front. Um, you know, making sure things are sized properly because they're almost impossible to fix later. And if you think about the lifespan of the building, I mean, you only really get one shot at some things. Um, and to make sure that those are done correctly at, at, at start. So like, for example, making sure, you know, whatever your flow rate per filter is, is, you know, looking at specific filters, you know, maybe having in mind that those manufacturers won't be here in five to 10 years. And what are some other potential, you know, if, if in, I know it costs money to add space, but, you know, keeping in mind what that cost is, you know, but if you're short on airflow in 10 years, and I'm, my guess is that it, things are probably only going to get warmer and sows are going to keep producing more heat. Um, I don't see that trend reversing anytime soon, but, you know, having that in mind, kind of a little bit future proofing, some of those things might be, might be um, something to kind of keep in mind. Same mm -hmm. with, and that is like having power, making sure there's sufficient power. There's a lot of sow farms that are using 99.9% .9 of how much service is going in there. And that gives you basically zero, zero room for, um, you know, any additions or changes in technology in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. And I also like the idea, the comment that you made about technology and, and those service providers may not be there in five years from now, those manufacturers of, of whatever it may be, filters, units, et cetera. And that's something we have seen um, quite dramatically in the swine industry is so much change so quickly. I would say definitely in the last 15 to 20 years that you know, how do we plan for that? Because again, we see some facilities that are, you know, 10 to 15 years built now and they're wanting to up, upgrade, but they may not have, have been prepared for how some of their technology communicates with the new technology. So how do we work through that? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure if I have a good answer for it either. Um, you know, it, it's tough. I mean, it, it's probably making sure the, I guess for me, maybe making sure the hardware side of things is is solid and then software is something that can be changed all the time with, you know, updates and other things. So at least on and kind of going back to the ventilation thing, you know, cutting a new hole, you know, cutting 50 more holes for more inlets is not feasible. Um, you know, so again, making sure at least the hardware side and, you know, then the operation of such a thing can just be kind of updated as, you know, you know, you can add sensors, change software you know, over the air to some extent. Um, and, and that's probably is, is probably focusing on the hardware solution side of it. And then, you know, realizing that software is somewhat a little bit more adaptable in, with time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. The other thing I heard you also um, say in there um, that I actually thought was a little bit interesting was the airflow, making sure we get airflow correct. And I've I've sat in so many different ventilation talks and there's always argument over well, what's correct airflow. So how do we figure that out? <laughs> um, <laughs> unless you're me, <laughs> yeah, or right. you're it's pretty pretty dang hard. Um, um, yeah, I mean, if you really want to measure it, which I I don't advise you, and I think my former grad students and a lot of others who've gone through grad programs across the country in this area can attest that. Um, it is not a fun process. You have to have a device called the fan assessment numeration system. It is heavy and awkward, and it basically has multiple propellers that traverse up and down that, um, you know, you integrate airspeed over area and you can get airflow. Um, and you put one of those on the intake side of the fan and, you know, in I guess probably about two minutes, you know what the exact airflow is with uh, less than, or yeah, greater than 5% accuracy, 95% accuracy. Um, but so, well, what really matters is, you know, it comes down to the environment inside the barn. And so using your humidity, you know, carbon dioxide, maybe some other gases, depending on your system, is paying attention to those is really going to give you a good indicator, at least on, on cold weather side, is am I getting close to the right airflow, air, air exchange rate inside the barn um, is, is important. And on the hot weather side, you know, just watching, you know, the difference between inside and outside temperature, if you don't have cooling, you know, again, we try to keep it no more than about four Fahrenheit. And if you do have evaporative cooling pads, obviously you will be cooler than outside conditions. But again, limiting that difference between the pad exit temperature and then the the temperature gain from the pad to the inside of the barn is the next, you know, kind of just again, same concept, just watching it a little bit different numbers. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's something I always notice too is 
quite frequently whenever there was an issue, particularly in a sow barn, maybe the litters broke with scours or, or whatever, one of our first instincts is to go adjust that thermostat, that controller, uh, right? Change temperature, change fan speed, whatever it might be to try to create better comfort, um, which can sometimes go the wrong direction. And particularly when we talk about living in an area where we do today, where we have four different seasons and two of those seasons can get some pretty wide range in temperatures. How often do you suggest that we assess barn environment in a cell farm? I think you need to add one. The seasons change daily. We can have That's all four. True. In Iowa, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in terms of, of change in settings, I I prefer it. So touching the, the controller is the easiest and fastest potential solution. Um, however, you know, there's generally some underlying problem that probably should be addressed and the controller should be maybe the second thing. Um, but sometimes, you know, when it comes down to time and, and cost and labor, um, the controller sometimes can be the probably the better option out of them. But, um, you know, typically, you know, a summer and a winter season is a good start for settings. But most of the time, you know, there's really not a whole lot that needs to change too much um between the two i mean i wouldn't just because again time and labor you know if you're fiddling around with making sure sops are changed by season and you know with i'd say with some of these springs and falls lately it's pretty hard to put a you know a date on when when do those go into effect because you know if you you do it at the wrong date and it gets warm when you're in winter mode uh, you're out of luck um especially if you start sealing off fans and doing some other things uh, so I think from a simplicity standpoint, it's easier to kind of just stick with one throughout the year and and going back to the design and, and equipment, making sure that equipment's in there that can handle kind of that, that uh, dry, dynamic weather that we often experience on a day-to-day basis. Right. Very good. Um, well, let's kind of jump over to Ween to finish for a minute and let's talk again. Let's start with design. So, you know, what are some things that we should be looking for with the design of a lean to finish barn today? Um, I think from ventilation, probably not a whole lot has been too interesting compared to sows, I'd say in the last five to 10 years, but um, there's still, you know, things are constantly evolving. I'd say probably technology is creeping its way into the wean to finish side of things, um, especially with remote access for, you know, a lot of producers who aren't typically there all day, um, being able to kind of check in and make sure things are going right has really kind of probably changed that side of things. Um, I think there's still the continued discussion of pit fans versus sidewall fans. Do we need pit fans? I think that conversation still, um, keeps going on. Um, I think everybody's got a kind of an opinion about it. Um, so, um, that's a probably a good, interesting one, um, and say probably the other one with kind of moving some of the more, um, the larger direct drive fans that have been on the positive pressure sow farms, you know, like a Munner's M drive, a Hawkslet and infinity fan, um, the JP commander ones, you know, those kind of making their way into tunnel barns as a, you know, a way to, you know, reduce energy costs and kind of smooth out that transition from say, you know, whether state, whatever the last stage of uh, 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 inlets are, so stage five to stage six where tunnel one starts, um, just kind of smoothing that out a little bit is kind of kind of unique. Um, probably the other thing would be, um, you know, maybe seeing more barns with radiant tube heaters in them instead of um, individual brooders per pen or two brooders per pen, just tubes going down the length of the barn. Um, you know, cuts a lot down on labor and maintenance between seasons. Um, you know, they hang up there all year. You don't have to worry quite as much about pilots going out, you know, picking them up, moving them, raising lower and stuff like that. And so I, it's another kind of interesting one that's kind of, I see a little bit more frequently as I keep going out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. What are some maybe hiccups that we should be watching for and, and try to avoid in the wean to finish barn? Hiccups. Hmm. Let's see. I think with with all of them is is getting the pig started right. Um, it, preheating the barn with sufficient time, making sure the concrete's warm. You know, it, concrete takes at least a day ish or more to warm up, depending on several factors. But um, you know, it takes time. Um, you know, making sure it's 
pretty much draft free, dry and warm. Um, so when the pigs get off the truck, they've got a pretty good environment to go into. Um, that's probably one of the, the, especially out here. I mean, maybe not in all climates, but at least this one, um, we need to always be paying attention to that. That's a good point. You uh, have said the word technology multiple times while we've been visiting. And so let's go there. What are some technologies that you see on the horizon that, that could bring value to our swine industry? Hmm. Oh, well, that's a good one. I guess I haven't thought too much about that. Um, I guess from more of a ventilation side, I think maybe some of the heat exchangers um, could be kind of interesting as we probably as propane costs keep, you know, increasing and the, the, say the increase in propane costs and desire to increase air quality in wintertime. So, you know, humidity management and, and, you know, noxious gases management. So I think revisiting, you know, recapturing some of that heat that's lost through ventilation, since I think it's about 80 to 90% of all the total heat loss in winter is right out through the fan. Um, so that opportunity with new technology in terms of, you know, the, the, the fin designs and, and cleaning and things like that could maybe help spur, you know, that decrease in propane, but, you know, by simultaneously improving air quality at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. We've talked a little bit about technology. We've talked about building designs, measuring airspeed, airflow. Are there classes or opportunities for people who want to learn a little bit more about what to do within their barns? Yeah, um, you know, depending on what level you want to get into that, um, probably a more, if you want to kind of a broad view that includes design and management, the Swine Science Online, I think it's a ANS 382. That sound right? It's the one Jay Harmon teaches um, mm -hmm. is a good one for more remote learning. Um, for the more hands-on side, I mean, at least if you're here in Iowa or within some of the surrounding states, um, you know, you can have, you know, personalized to some extent ventilation workshops. Um, otherwise, I mean, I still like the trusty Midwest Plan Service 32 that's available on the Iowa State Extension and Outreach Store. It's got, I mean, it's stood the test of time, but it's got great information if you're looking to just kind of learn the ins and outs of you know, design and, and management um, desperately need some updating, but it, it's a great overview if you're, if that's part of one's duties in, in a company. Um, some other good books out there, but um, they're good ones. Okay. No, that's very useful. Um, I'm going to jump kind of backwards a little bit. You had mentioned with the sows, um, as time goes on here, they might produce more heat. And I think that's sometimes an interesting conversation and one that maybe people don't really recognize and let's not do the sow. Let's just talk grow finish because people are probably a little bit more comfortable with that. If we think of a barn of 1200 pigs growing in, in a wean to finish barn, how much heat do they typically produce? Um, I want to say on the total heat, it's, it's right around a million something BTUs per hour. I got to switch in and out of Watson BTUs, which is always a bit of fun. Um, on, on the actual heat that's added to the air, I believe it's around like 600 to 700,000 BTUs of sensible heat. And then the rest of the million minus is the latent side of it, mm -hmm. um, which is a change of uh, moisture from a, a, a fluid to a vapor. Mm -hmm. I think you've given a, a number once like to heat your house. Do you it's like furnaces or something going 24 7. Or it's, it's like basically. Yeah. If you leave all three of your LV whites on, that'd be about the same sensible heat, I believe. Then okay. So three LV whites all the time is about how much heat the 1200 head barn is producing on any given day, time point, et cetera. Yep. So I, like I, think that. that's an, I think that's important for the listeners to think about, right, is, is how do we move that much air? Because I, I would agree, I think that's probably one of the things that, that we get caught the most of in Wean to Finish particularly in the winter months when it's cold out, we want to try to keep as much of that heat inside, but even the small pigs are going to have a lot of respiration and they're going to generate some heat. And so, you know, ventilation, even in the winter tends to be one of our harder ones to manage. 
yeah, with all that good heat that still it's it's more important for for moisture and gas control in, in winter than than you kind of gotta stop worrying about the heat so much and focus on the pig's health and and you know productivity side of things to to get that dialed in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I can't remember how much moisture they produce, but it's 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 especially when you tie respiration moisture, but it's also, you know, evaporation off the slats and, you know, off the pit too also contribute quite a bit to that total amount of moisture that has to come out of the barn. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Are there any other key points or takeaways you would like for our audience to be thinking about when it comes to ventilation that we haven't talked about today? Oh, I'm just, it's important. (laughs) Can't forget it. (laughs) I can't be on the back burner on, on, you know, most things like it tends to be, um, you know, maintenance is critical. Understanding it's critical. Um, you know, if you need resources or help, feel free to reach out or, you know, you can Google a little bit and there's some good stuff out there. Um, but yeah, it's one of those things, you know, it, you know, the ventilation workshop, I think is, here's the thing is, uh, you know, the unseen employee, because it is, you know, something that is working, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And if it fails, it's pretty catastrophic. Um, if the right fail safes aren't put in say put in place. Um, but you know, as it's easy to take it for granted when things are working well, but you know, when things don't work, it, it, it's very problematic. So that's, you know, it's one of those things that always got to kind of keep checking, keep maintaining and, and know, know what's, what to do and when uh, in the daily, you know, list of the thousand things I have to get done. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, that's very good. Well, Brett, um, we always like to ask our guest speaker a couple of questions. And so we're going to kind of jump over to that now. Um, the first question I'd like to ask you really kind of goes around swine resource. You'd mentioned a couple earlier, but there are any swine resources that you would recommend to our listeners? Yeah, I mean, just because it's out on my desk at the moment, just by chance, I was, you know, reading the Environmental Management and Animal Ag by Stan Curtis the other other week, refreshing myself on animal responses to the environment, and that's that's a, a just good classic book that I, I quite enjoy. Um, you know, not super ventilation heavy, but on understanding the animal and its responses and, and modeling and 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 kind of that whole area is it's a I mean, it's a really solid, thorough book that covers so many different topics that if you haven't read that one, I would highly encourage checking out. I think it was published in 89. I should know this. 83, sorry. Um, so it's been around for a while, but, um, you know, the information in it is, is great. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like it would be, especially if we start talking about what the animal experiences during environmental changes. I think that's good for our producers to take a look at and think about maybe in a little bit different way than what we currently look at it. Um, so the next question we like to ask is, if, how about something that's not related to pigs? Is there a book or an audio book that you're reading or listening to currently that you would recommend to the group? Yeah, so I, I'm also a, a member of the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, and um, it's ASHRAE for short. Um, and they they put out a uh, monthly journal, I believe, or a quarterly journal um, that they have their members write and contribute articles to. And it's um, you know obviously all tailored towards human occupied spaces and sometimes plants, but mostly humans. Um, and some of the information they have in there is um, just really interesting to see kind of their perspective and and also look at when you you know they have their technologies and things are so much different for um you know when you don't have to make a profit on your building you know it's a very different view than when that building has to cash flow every every turn versus the building that you and i are sitting in right now is you know doesn't have to make money it's you know it's a single single direction for our pure comfort and and saving utilities for the university so even though my office is freezing cold at the moment, um, but that's a, it's a good journal. I mean, if not everybody's going to be a member to get it, but um, I think they also, Ashray has a podcast now that they just came out with in the last couple of years. Um, I think they go over some of the topics. So, you know, things like one of the big ones right now with, with um, especially due to um, the pandemic was reevaluating, you know, air exchange rates in like schools and our office environments and what the the limit for carbon dioxide is. and 
I believe right now it's a thousand PPM for the time weighted average for our, our occupied spaces. But, you know, with changing in air exchange rates and some new studies coming out on, on that kind of lower continuous exposure to CO2 concentrations, uh, and there's been a lot of articles on it. So it's kind of interesting just to read from that side and the impact it has on humans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is really interesting. That could be some fun reading for sure. Uh, well, the last question we like to ask our guest speaker really goes around um, if you can think of somebody in your life that you've defined as successful, what's a key trait that they have that you think has allowed them to be successful? Um, I can think of a lot of really great mentors I've had over the years in and outside of academia. But I, I think the one thing that sticks out for a lot of those people uh, to me is, is perseverance. Um, you know, that's, you know, just being persistent, you know, in spite of, you know, things being challenging, difficult, um, delays, adversity, I mean, all those things, but it's that perseverance that I think really kind of defines some of those people. Um, because when everything's going good, it's, you know, it's great, but when it's bad is when I think a lot of the true character is shown and that's what kind of separates, um, you know, people who are successful and, and, and others in, in, in my mind. Mm -hmm. no, that's a good one. I like that trait. Well, Brett, I do want to thank you for your time today. Uh, for our audience, again, this is Dr. Brett Ramirez. He's a assistant professor at Iowa State University. Uh, we greatly appreciate your expertise and sharing with us some of the trips and tricks of, of ventilation and things to consider, whether we're building new or we're thinking about renovating those barns and, and what we need to be considering in that process. So. Again, thank you for your time today. We greatly appreciate it. Anytime, you're most certainly welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Imagine if with a few key concepts, you could have the potential to create a massive positive impact by bringing from hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars for swine producers. Join us on this small group and go to the next level of swine nutrition on this seven week long elite online training and applied swine nutrition and feeding by myself and my world-class invited speakers. Additionally, you enjoy an exclusive community to exchange ideas. Go now to www.eliteswinenutritionist.com.